Uh, thank you for being here. Um, thank you for joining us tonight um, for our green drinks um, screening of an imperfect advocate. Um, we again just some quick housekeeping rules. Um, keep your video off. Keep yourself muted. Um, if you're having any tech issues, feel free to send that in the chat. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please put that in the chat as well. Um, and I will send it over to Mike to kick us off. Thanks so much, Priscilla. <clears throat> I'm assuming people can see me now. It looks like my camera is working and that people can hear me, but somebody send me a chat message if that's not the case. Um, my name is Mike Riley. I am executive director here at the Environmental Center, and we're just thrilled to have you all uh, here with us tonight. Um, for the film, An Imperfect Advocate, featuring Grand Zimmerman. Um, you know, the Environmental Center is a local nonprofit organization that I imagine most of you know, but maybe if you don't, um, based here in Bend, but we serve the Central Oregon region. And our mission is to embed sustainability into daily life in Central Oregon. Um, <clears throat> we do that with all kinds of different work, with um, uh, work with youth in schools and getting them uh, environmentally literate, but also trying to turn them into environmental advocates and ac activists. We do a lot um, with waste and recycling in the community, and we also do a fair bit on advocacy work, trying to make policy change uh, here in Central Oregon, but also across the state of Oregon to support a sustainable future. And another thing that we do is about building community in Central Oregon and bringing people together to learn about and to celebrate and um, to take action around sustainability. And tonight's Green Drinks event is really about that, about bringing people together. Um, and of course, in this new COVID environment, we're doing that in new and different ways. So rather than being able to raise a glass and click it with you and say cheers directly, we're doing that remotely. Um, and this is our first time experimenting with a film as a way to bring people together. So Green Drinks is um, a program that exists all across uh, the planet. It's in like over 600 cities across the world and people get together to to do what I talked about, to learn and connect and celebrate stuff that's going on and figure out ways to improve stuff to make things more sustainable in the communities and the places that they live, work, play and learn. So we are part of a global movement tonight um, across the whole, the whole planet Earth to um, come together and do that um, as a community. So we're excited that you're all here tonight um, and looking forward to enjoying this film. Um, so, uh, in addition to this brief welcome, we're going to, uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to show you the film. Um, we do have some stuff from Graham. Unfortunately, Graham has not been, is not going to be able to join us tonight. I mean, he may be able to pop in, but he had something come up last minute um, that made it not possible for him to actually be present with us in person live tonight. We did manage to get, um, I think, some recordings of him a uh, answering some common questions that he gets from people when they uh, when they see the film. And then Neil and I, instead of um, having a live Q&A with um, Graham, you're gonna be stuck or, or get the opportunity to, to be with Neil and I, and we're gonna talk a little bit about some of what's going on around the policy perspective around sustainability and um, climate action, uh, both at the local level and at the state level in Oregon. So we're gonna do a little bit of that and have a chance for some Q&A there. Um, and that'll be the wrap for tonight. So again, thanks so much for coming. Let me just give a quick intro about Graham. Um, <clears throat> Graham Zimmerman is an award-winning professional climber, a well-recognized creative, and a vocal climate activist. He works as a producer and the director of development with Bedrock Film Works, where he applies the extensive logistics, rigging, marketing, and media expertise he's developed as an athlete in the outdoor industry. Uh, and in this film, Graham sees firsthand the effects of climate, of human-driven climate change on the world and decides that he must take action. It's a path that forces him to confront his personal carbon footprint as he becomes an imperfect advocate. Um, so that's the film tonight, is an imperfect ad advocate, and we're looking forward to uh, join it with you here. And I think that Graham has a recorded video intro. Is that correct, Neil? Yep, we should, uh, that should be um, starting to play right now. Hey everybody, Graham here. Um, I am absolutely delighted that you're here to watch this film. Um, you know, I live here in Bend. 
uh, this is where I do a lot of my work. This is where I do a lot of my training. Uh, this is where my core community resides. You are part of that. So, you know, being able to tell this story to you, um, being able to share this film with you is really, is really special. And I think you'll recognize a number of the places in the film, um, which will be kind of fun. And uh, yeah, I really, my, my hope is that you are entertained by this. Um, I think that Jim Aikman, my business partner and the director of this film, did a great job of creating something that's pretty fun to watch. And, uh, and I, also hope, I also hope you're inspired. Um, and when we talk about inspiration, you know, I want you to look at this as, you know, this is my, this is my path towards working on climate policy. This is my path for kind of building the resilience and the grit needed to talk about something that is challenging and, you know, is something that is, for me, is imperfect. But, uh, but as you look at this, I want you to think about your own goals. I want you to think about the, own, the things that you want to do and think about how you, know, you can apply the same sort of methodology, the same sort of grit, the same sort of uh, managing your own potential hypocrisy um, to get done what you want to do. Um, I also encourage you to think about climate change because it's really important. So with that, hope you really enjoy and uh, we'll see you afterwards for a Q&A. All right, um, so that was a quick intro from uh, Graham, and we are, assuming the technology works, going to be able to get um, the film loaded. So um, sit back, enjoy, and then we'll join back afterwards for some uh, Q&A from Graham and then from some more discussion from Mike and I. Don't worry, it's just loading. All right, here we go. Okay, Graham Zimmerman. Good God, here we go. My name's Graham Zimmerman, and what do I do for a living? It really all starts in climbing. Working as a professional alpinist. I go to these wild corners of the world, climbing in New Zealand, in Alaska, in the Pakistani Karakoram, and I love it. <laughs> but it certainly came with a price of a lot of plane flights, a lot of times sitting and driving in a car, a lot of ropes, a lot of tents, a lot of jackets. But to be honest, I was so focused on climbing that I didn't really give a damn about anything else. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, who am I to be an advocate for climate change? Over the last 10 or 15 years, I've really been focused on developing this kind of athlete brand, Graham Zimmerman Alpinist. And what that means is I work with a variety of different companies and they support me to go to the biggest mountains of the world and try to do things that have never been done before. But at some point, as I've been spending more time in the mountains, I felt like there was kind of a reckoning. This is a space on which you rely. This is a space that you love. It's also, you know, like doesn't hide much. When changes are happening, you can see them there. I graduated from university in 2007, studied glacial hydrology down in southeastern New Zealand. So I'm spending all this time in the mountains. I have this background in science, but when you're in your early 20s, it's pretty easy to just kind of have your head in the sand. And I recognize now that it's becoming harder and harder to ignore. Changes that we see in alpine landscapes caused by human carbon emissions. And actually experiencing that with your own senses in that space, it's really hard and it really makes you 
question the work that you're doing. But I didn't want to give up climbing. I didn't want to stop this momentum that I had generated as an athlete. I'm getting a weird kind of like impingement back here, it feels like. I spent the last 15 years of my life abusing the shit out of my body. I'm playing for it. You feel that click? Yeah, I did. You know, who am I to be an advocate for climate change? I'm somebody who goes on the other side of the world and does this climbing thing. And that really felt like there would be so much hypocrisy within that stance that it would make it ineffective and it would just, just wouldn't work. Let's see. Just got in from the URA Ice Festival. And then tomorrow I fly out to Boston and then drive up to North Conway, New Hampshire, where we're going, going to another ice festival. A lot of spending time on airplanes in this job. I feel like I had all of the tools to be an advocate, but they were totally outweighed by my doubts. A couple years ago, I bumped into one of the folks from Protect Our Winners. Protect Our Winners is a climate advocacy organization. Their whole goal is to essentially weaponize athletes to be climate advocates. Athletes are known storytellers. They have a following of people who want to hear those stories and being able to effectively talk about the ways that climate change is impacting their ability to enjoy and experience the places that they love. She just kind of said, listen, like with your background, like why aren't you working as a climate advocate? Kind of laid out all these excuses for her and her response was like, oh no, you're like the perfect person to be a climate advocate. And that's kind of where my journey as a climate activist started. And it would be really nice if all my concerns about being kind of an imperfect advocate went away, but they didn't. It's like, man, like, is this really the best way to be a climate activist? Hey guys. Hi. Hi. <laughs> it's good to see everybody. Yeah, nice good to see you too. Um, so you guys are at the Environmental Club, correct? Yes. yes. Cool. Do you guys have questions for Graham, just about any of his like advocacy things he does? That's difficult. Have you like again. stopped flying and driving and stuff because of like the carbon emissions? Um, I I haven't. Um, I have tried to be. I, I have started trying to be more intentional with my carbon footprint. But like, uh, I mean, I'm on like two flights this week, and I, I don't know that I have like a super clear ac a clear super clear answer for you guys about like. Here's, here is the solution. I know you said that you want to move forward and you want to like get new technology and like as someone in the spotlight, it just seems like it becomes really hard if we're not the ones who are going to stop driving, then who is? Here's what you can do to you yeah. know have an impact. Here's what other people are doing. And I think daily choices because I think it's not necessarily one thing, but sort of like reducing in multiple areas. Let's see. So I feel like, like, um... We have ice festivals all over the country. They bring me out to tell stories, teach them how to ice climb. And I want you to push with your left foot and roll through. Teaching them how to bring it into a zone of inner peace. Finding the zen on the climb. You guys gonna do more?
Graham's a great motivated climber and it's the most ideal messenger for climate because we know, hey, this is what's going on. This is what it's looking like. And he can be that guy to talk about it. And you were talking about the confluence between that and your like love of the environment. Yes. Conrad is one of the best when it comes to alpine climbing. And he's been somebody who really welcomed me to the tribe of hard alpine climbers. The ice is world class here. It's a really unique setting and a beautiful place to be. Check, check, awesome. The community's having a good time climbing and swapping stories, enjoying nature. It's a Midwest spirit. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm a warrior for the climate because I love being out here. If we see change, it's up to us as outdoor enthusiasts to report that to the world. And so I'd like to bring to the stage Graham Zimmerman. Thanks, Bill. Um, so we're going to do a panel tonight, guys. And I'm going to bring these guys up here. It's a great time for us to discuss the changes that we've seen in the big mountains of the world. Where we go and what we see at the high altitude and high latitude parts of this planet are the most rapidly affected areas due to climate change. So we have to speak out on behalf of the glaciers and the, the flowers, the mountain goats, the birds, the whole ecosystem that's out there that we are very much a part of. But if it does not succeed, humans do not succeed. So it's really, it's not about saving the planet, it's about saving humanity. And at the core of that is how we address carbon. I've realized that being able to go outside for outdoor recreation is an incredible privilege. And climate change, it's really about speaking up for the people who are losing their homes and their lives and make it much bigger than just our outdoor privilege. We can stop this now if we make it all of our problem, and that's the one thing that we have yet to do. What we're really talking about is having a majority of the population care about preserving our ability to live comfortably on this planet. And that includes people of color, many of whom you know, will never go skiing a day in their life, but they still need fresh air and clean water. To care for the environment, you have to love it. You have to be drawn to it. And if we can teach that, we're doing the right thing. All of these different issues, they all matter. Understanding those places where they come together, that's something I've been working, working really hard on. It feels really nice to kind of be out in the cold, what it feels like to have your fingertips a little frozen. Your lungs feel that cold air coming in. I mean, it's winter, it's magical. That's what we're trying to protect. This is it. I love this stuff. Right now, we're headed down to the lower peninsula, to the universities there. We're definitely stepping outside of my community, outside of my bubble, and outside of my comfort zone. Um, should we dive in? Yeah. Okay, cool. I am a professional mountain climber focused on putting up new routes in what we refer to as the greater ranges, where all of our 8,000 meter peaks are, all the, all the things are really, really, really tall. And they're also where I've started to see things changing. This is, this is Chamonix around the turn of the century, the last century. This is what it looks like there now. This is up in Canada in 2009. This is eight years later. I kind of came to the realization that A, climbing is really wonderful, but is it really that important? Like maybe it's only important when it applies to what I can do with my climbing. We do not solve this problem by sitting back and doing nothing, which seems very, very basic. And so what does it mean to be an imperfect advocate? 
When it comes down to it, the most effective tool that we have are our stories. And that is something that each of you have. Now, we're gonna talk about Powell's vision here, which is action over apathy, which is the idea that you have to do something. Our American representative of democracy is currently under a lot of stress because of big business, because of big business's influence in our democracy, and because people aren't voting. And how do we reduce that stress? We engage. So let's get at it together and be supportive of each other. Does that make sense? Woo! Yeah! One, two, three, two! Graham's ability to build these communities around people who want to care, who do care, is a really great tool that he has. <laughs> <laughs> That's got to make it into a film. Looking at the schedule, it looks like some bigger opportunities are going to come up here in the next few months. Senator Wyden, this is Graham Zimmerman. I feel like I'm learning how to communicate more effectively on this stuff and more confidently on this stuff so that I can do so in a bigger stage. Here at the Capitol building in Salem today. We're fired up. Yeah. Um, so twenty 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 has been quite has been quite a ride thus far. We came home from Michigan and we had a lot of momentum. Global economic activity has been put into an induced coma. And everything shut down. And we had to go into a space where we were totally redesigning how we talk to our communities. All right, I think we're live. Liz, um, hey everybody. You know, spending time in front of the computer, talking to people, trying to like gather audiences, trying to share information. But like, what are, what are we gonna learn from this? Protests over the death of George Floyd, the black man who died in the custody of a white police officer, have continued in the city now for six days and six nights, and they have spread well beyond Minneapolis. A lot of people are having a lot harder time right now than I am. You know, that demonstrates a lot of privilege. I had this realization that I had this blind spot when it came to how social justice and climate intersect in the United States and why one cannot exist without the other. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. And that's something I've been working really hard on understanding those intersections in a way that makes the world a better place for everybody. To create a more equitable society. That's what we're trying to get at. You know, we're taking this time in order to think about our future and the kind of world that we want to leave behind for the next generation. There are so many things going on in the world right now. This is stuff that's all really important, but we cannot forget about climate because this just continues to matter and is only going to matter more. And our goal with solving the climate crisis is not to stop traveling, stop heating our homes, because that's, that's not achievable. Nobody wants that. Our goal is to move into a space where we can continue to do these things that inspire us and drive us, but just do so in a carbon neutral or carbon efficient way by crafting systemic change that will be driven by policy and economic incentivization. And that all comes from government. So I think the solution to all of that is to engage with what I would refer to as imperfect advocacy. You know, we all make mistakes we're always learning. And if we let those imperfections give us permission to totally ignore the climate crisis, then we will never solve this problem.
this work will probably not be finished in my lifetime. I was freaking out to do this. If I want to continue to drive change, I'm just going to have to keep working at it. That's kind of where applying the grit and endurance for mountain climbing shows up in advocacy. So, climbing, changing the world, trying to stay sane. Here we go. <sighs> Members of the Sustainable Energy and Environmental Coalition, thank you for taking the time to meet with us today, particularly given the challenging times we currently find ourselves in. In our current system, we are all imperfect when it comes to climate. And we are finding time and time again that in order to curb emissions, it is not a change in personal actions that is going to move the needle. In fact, what is needed is systemic change to our industries, to our methods for collecting and generating power, and how we transport ourselves and our goods. And we're not just doing this for the climbers or the skiers or just for the mountains, but for every American and every citizen of our world particularly those that are marginalized, as these are the communities who are most affected by climate change. And we are showing that imperfect advocacy is not only okay, but it is vital. And without it, our only other choice is to sit back and watch the world burn, which I think you will all agree is unacceptable. It is an honor to be able to share my story with you. Thank you. Alrighty, um, that was great. I wish uh, wish we had Graham here um, to talk, but um, we were able to ask him a couple of questions ahead of time. And so he was uh, gracious enough to record his answers. And these are a lot of the questions that he gets asked um, normally. So um, sorry, I noticed in the chat that we the chat doesn't actually exist. It's the questions area. Um, but go ahead and throw questions into the chat. Um, we would, we're going to have a discussion here a little bit later. Um, so both as um, as Graham is answering these questions in a video um, and just continuously um, throw those questions in the question section and um, we'll get this next little chunk loaded. Okay, so yeah, that was really good. I hadn't watched the whole thing through yet. Um, so super happy. All right, here's uh, some of the questions that you may have been asking or thinking already. Hey everybody, I really hope that you enjoyed the film. Um, Graham, here again, your subject. Um, so as you might gather from uh, from the sunshine, sunshine that is coming through my window, I'm actually recording this early. Um, the Environmental Center has been very patient with me as I've had a big uh, film shoot come up this afternoon and, uh, and have recorded these questions early. So thank you, Environmental Center, for being patient with me. Um, and what we're gonna do is I'm gonna answer a few questions that have kind of been gathered from the crew over there. And then, uh, and then Mike and Neil are gonna come on and they're gonna engage in some dialogue around uh, more kind of local efforts and looking at can it, you know, what next steps, both locally and federally with, um, with climate, which uh, I actually will engage with because I'm really excited to hear what they have to say. Um, but kind of diving into some of the questions that came up around the film, um, you know, the first one, and it's, and it's a big one, is, you know, how do you deal with being called a hypocrite? Hypocrite. Um, you know, the, the internet is kind of a, a swamp of people saying mean things these days, and it's something that we consistently have to deal with. And, uh, and I think that, you know, as a, um, as a, as a kind of super high level mark, if you're out there and you're letting your voice be heard and, and uh and you're doing that publicly i think that my my kind of baseline policy is to read comments listen to people what people have to say and consider it see see if anything shows up that feels like it resonates oftentimes it's just a bunch of hogwash and you should just delete that comment and block that person um so that's kind of uh that's something that like i'll just go ahead and give you permission to do um 
But when it comes to hypocrisy around climate change, it's a really tricky deal. And something that we didn't get at in the film that was in one of the interviews and ended up ended up kind of in the in the in the mix with uh with you know like the fi final cut cutting room uh with the final cut but then ended up on the cutting room floor is this is kind of this discussion around you know my personal impact versus systemic versus you know should i you know the fact that systemic change is the main thing that we should be focused on does that mean that like i don't really have to care about what i do personally and what i'm going to encourage you to do is look at your carbon footprint the same way that you might look at your bank account um carbon is something that in our current system we have to spend in order to get things done whether that's things we want to do recreationally or we want to do uh professionally or we want to do for advocacy um it is a huge component of me sitting here presenting to you right now since my computer is being uh run on a grid that is being run off of fossil fuels and um and so that's that's kind of the you know that's kind of the thing that I love to say and I really believe is that like we need to we need to live examined lives. Um, for me personally, um, you know I don't I don't eat meat. Um, I'm almost totally plant based except for occasional cheese does happen, which is fine. I like cheese. Um, and uh, you know and I try not to drive my car very much. When I do drive, I drive a hybrid. Um, you know these are things that that I do think about and I do and you act on. Um, and then with expedition climbing, you know, I look at the expeditions that I want to go on. I kind of par them down. I used to, when I was younger, when I was in my early 20s, I'd go on any expedition I was invited on uh, and that I could afford. But uh, but these days I'm, I'm very, very diligent about choosing trips that have a lot of, a lot of meaning to me and uh, are things that I'm able to prepare for really well and are, uh, and, and have a component that I can use in order to further my other goals, primarily around climate policy. Because, you know, the reason that anybody's really listening to me right now about climate is mostly because I'm a climber. So that's a, so that's kind of like, you know, those are all things that I kind of put into the mix. But something I'd love to present to you is the idea of what we, what, what we can look at as our future, um, a future that we want to live in. Because I think that, you know, when we, when we look at just whittling down our personal carbon footprint into the future, that means eventually we end up in a space where we live in our house we don't heat it we we don't drive anywhere we don't you know like we only go places where we can ride our bike and we're really only living off of plant-based foods that maybe we grow in our backyard um that's like getting to the extreme so and i don't think that that's really what any of us are aiming for or any of us really want so what if we instead look at what systemic change can bring us? And when I look at that, I look at a home that is heated, uh, a home that is heated on, you know, from electricity that is coming from a renewable grid and then having a car in the garage that is plugged into a renewable grid because it's an electronic vehicle. And then I want to go climb in the Canadian Rockies and I drive part way. I plug into another, you know, to an EV charging station halfway up to Canmore, Alberta, and that's another EV station. That's another that's an EV plugging spot that's that's uh, run on renewables. I cross the border. I go climb in Canada. You know, I'm able to charge my car on renewables up there, and then I drive back. And I'm able to go and do that thing that I want to do, that thing that I that I love, that really fills my cup, and uh, and able to, able to do it. You know, maybe not carbon. Uh, neutral, but certainly in a more carbon efficient way. And that's really like when I look at the future, that's, that's what I want. That's what I want us to work towards. I want us to be able to do the things that we love, the things that get us fired up. And I want us to be able to do so in a, in a, you know, carbon efficient manner. And as we look at air travel, you know, there is technology um, that, that can kind of move us in that direction. Certainly, um, in terms of cars, we're like, totally headed in that direction. In terms of powering our grid, we are like, we have all the technology we need. Really the only hangups we have are around, um, around the policy and uh, how subsidized oil and gas are. So that's, that's really why, um, you know, we look at a green energy economy and we look at these, you know, local, state and federal um, objectives around the stuff. That's how we get this done. That's how we get this stuff done. And you know, as we said in the film, like we're all hypocrites when it comes to climate because of the current system. And so that's when we look at my hypocrisy, when we look at your hypocrisy, um, 
the way that we deal with that is by dealing with a system that that forces us to be hypo- hypocrites that ugh, forces us to be hypocrites and so that's that's really the main thing that i'm trying to get at okay so then the next question is will you share what someone who is not a professional athlete can do and uh and that's a really good that's a really good question. Um, you know, I've kind of been like thrust onto this uh, little soapbox of mine as an athlete, and uh, and I've really tried to I've really tried to use it as effectively as possible to talk about things that matter to me that aren't just climbing. But what can you do as somebody who you know, like if you're somebody who doesn't you know, if like I don't know, whatever, like you're not a professional athlete. I think that the thing that we all have is we all have community, we all have networks, we all have people that we talk to, and I think that talking to the people around us about the things that get us fired up, in my case, climate, I gather the same is true for many of you, um, is, a, is like the best place to start. And thinking about how we communicate that. And, and I think for me, I, you know, I look at, um, I look at how I can effectively communicate with people as you know, it's, it's one of the most important parts of what I do. And I'll go ahead and recommend a book if you like. Um, I guess this is, I'm recording this before, so this is just fully unsolicited advice, but here we go. Um, a book called Harvest the Vote, um, which, is, which is all about communicating with broad communities on uh, subjects like climate change. And it's all about meeting people where they're at, and it's all about becoming a better listener so that we can understand where somebody's at. Because if we don't know, we don't know, then we can't meet them there. And, you know, we, I, I, th- I find time and time again that we are all more on the same page than I realize. You know, it's like, uh, you know, politics has kind of turned into something akin to sports where, you know, we don't think about the fact that, oh, I'm a Chicago Bulls fan. It's just like what I am. And the way that we break down that, it was kind of like, we kind of move past that, uh, that label and we move into other parts of our lives and find connection there. Find connection with hunters or farmers that have relationship with geography, same way that I do. Have a relationship with the weather or with the climate, the same way that I do. Um, you know, understanding that the, the the warming waters that is affecting fishing uh, in you know in our rivers and streams is the same is coming from the warming snowpacks that I like to go climbing in. Um, and like finding finding those connections. And then that same, the same thing, that same kind of like meeting somebody where they're at is something that we can do with the intersections of climate, with the other problems that we have in society. One of my kind of biggest like quests right now, um, you know, as I kind of like, I'm on my, you know, personal, my personal learning is, is looking into the intersection between climate change and social justice. And it's this thing that, you know, they seem, they seem so separated. They seem like different problems, but there is so much common ground between them. There is so much, you know, shared, shared space of shared work that needs to be done. And, you know, I've kind of put myself in the position where what I work on is climate. And then I've worked on networking with people who are in the social justice space. And it's not an antagonistic relationship. It's not either or. It's how do we work together to get this work done? And, uh, and so as you look at the work you're doing, as you look at the, your communications with your community, with your family, with your you know, professional community, um, think about ways that you can meet people where they're at, give them room to be themselves within that conversation and place themselves within that conversation, within those problems, within those solutions. And then understand that just because somebody else has like a different kind of like main thing they're focused on, doesn't mean that you're on different sides. It means you're on just different parts of the same side. And the best thing that you can do is find where those things meet. Um, and then the last, the last question here is how did the lawmakers respond to your testimony? And uh, what was it like to do a testimony over Zoom? So um, I'll start out with the second part of that question, which is what was it like to do a testimony over Zoom? Normally when I go to DC to lobby, you know, it's, it's a day of flying out there. There's a day of, you know, horsing around because, you know, I took the, red eye to Chicago and then it's like get there kind of late and so there's not enough time to do much. And then I have a day of meetings and I do the same thing on the way back. So it ends up taking, you know, a week. And and that's fine. You know, that's like if the, if the, if the, that's the appropriate uh, action to be taking to get the work that we need to do done, awesome. But I'll tell you what, when I uh, 
when I did when I did that congressional testimony over Zoom, I like got got out of bed. I was able to sleep in. You know, I was able to get up, drink some coffee, eat some breakfast, put on my suit. Didn't really have to put shoes on, and uh, I was able to plop down um, in a space that I'm comfortable and present to some people that I find pretty intimidating. Um, and that was like kind of amazing. Uh, it was also very very carbon uh, efficient <laughs> and time efficient. Um, and uh, so that was, you know, it's kind of it's kind of amazing, kind of something that, you know, as we look at uh, our policy work and the future is something that I think we'll engage with more and more. Um, now, let's see, looking at um, how that was received, I should I should fully admit that that was kind of presented as like the finish line in the film. Um, we were we were presenting to the SEEC, the um, which is in the Environmental and Environment and Energy Conservation uh, Caucus, and um, and so it was like it was actually a presentation to a lot of friendlies, um, and in many ways it was a presentation that was designed to uh, set us up for, um, you know, building allyship rather than talking to the far side of of the bench, um, and that's something you know. So I think that's probably an important thing, kind of. A, there's a bit of storytelling there, but I thought I would just tell you about one uh, experience with a lawmaker that was that was really interesting to me. Was um, I met with? This is a few years ago now. I met with Representative Cook, who I think is still in office uh, in southeastern um, California, ardent, ardent Republican, ardent climate change denier. Um, we sit down with him. It's me and one of the executives from uh, Powder Corp, and a scientist, and another professional athlete. And, uh, and the other professional athlete had brought her gold medal. And I think that's the only reason he took the meeting, um, is he wanted to see, see that thing. And, um, and so we, we sit down and we kind of give him our spiel and he just totally ignored us. And then, and then bailed early on the meeting. We're all just kind of sitting there like, damn it. You know, that really, that really went poorly. You know, he didn't, he didn't respond at all to our, you know, to our conversations about why, why climate is important to us and our professions and our. Our careers and all that and he just he just doesn't really care um and then as we're kind of sitting there and one of his staffers is still sitting in the room his staffer kind of <clears throat> you know did you know that we're actually going to be uh on a totally green grid by 2050 and we're like what are you you know what are you talking about and he was like listen like the representative doesn't really give a lot of credence to, you know, your like, oh, I, I want to go skiing and climbing argument. Um, but we have a lot of sun. We're pulling, we're putting in a lot of solar. We're generating plenty. We're, we're going to be generating plenty for ourselves. And then we're selling it all to LA. So we're making a ton of money on it. And so, wow, we don't really care about the like green argument. We do care about making money. And I think you should work on rephrasing your argument because you could make it stronger. And it was this really interesting conversation where we were poorly received with the way that we were communicating on things because we weren't meeting this person where he was at. And if we had done a little more work to understand the work that he was doing, not just his like policy positions, but the actual actionables he was taking, then we could have had a much more productive conversation. And that's kind of one of the my biggest learning experiences in policy. And and it's something that we've taken into future meetings and we don't lead with like the climate is warming, our snow is going away. Um, you know, this is, you know, we have to maintain it for, you know, for our, for our children so they can ski. It's instead like, hey, listen, like there is huge opportunity here. There's huge opportunity for jobs. There's opportunity for energy security. Um, and, and this is something that, that if we move forward on, it's gonna be better for everyone, and uh, not just because of clean air, not because we have more snow, um, or I guess we don't lose as much snow, um, but because we all get to be employed, because we move away from coal mining, we move into building windmills, we move away from oil and gas plants, we move into building solar farms, and we, em we employ people, we give people clean air, and, uh, and people, people are able to make money People are able to see economic success. People are able to live better lives. And that's what all this comes down to. So um, with that, I'm going to pass you off to Mike and Neil. I really appreciate you hanging out this evening. Um, I hope you were inspired. And uh, listen, if you have questions, uh, don't tell me I'm wrong. 
feel free to reach out. Um, and uh, yeah, I think y'all are great. I appreciate you. And um, I look forward to seeing you out in the wild here sometime soon once we're through the COVID storm. And with that, my friends, be well, take care, and keep up the good work. We'll see you soon. All right. Um, that was great. Um, I'm not sure if folks can hear me, and hopefully Mike um, can join us as well. But we're going to go on to our next little um, our next little phase where we're going to talk. Um, okay, great. You can hear me, um, and Mike's here as well. So we're going to talk about um, some opportunities to get involved in policy and advocacy um, at three different levels. So we're going to kind of take all of this inspiration that we got from um, from Graham and Pow and then translate it for you um, into the city, state, and congressional level. Um, and we can take as much time as people are interested in. So um, <laughs> keep those questions coming in. And we're going to start at the city level. Um, uh, cities often have the opportunity to do really bold and exciting things. Um, and it's a, it's a lot more tangible of opportunity. So Mike's going to start by talking a little bit about transportation at the city level. Thanks, Neil. Um, can you hear me? Thumbs up? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> so, um, well, uh, I'm assuming that many of you or most of you are here in Central Oregon. Excuse me. Um, over the last couple of years in Bend, in particular, the Environmental Center has been very focused on the transportation system that we have here and trying to make sure that we get more investments in walking, biking uh, in particular and transit so that people have good infrastructure to get them out of their cars. Um, there's a theory in transportation that says if you build more roads, you, you will invite people to drive more. And actually pretty much all the evidence and all the studies across the United States and in Europe and other places actually prove this to be the case. It's very hard to build yourself out of transportation out of traffic because when you create more space people feel like oh i can drive more oh it's easier to get there oh i'll just go in the car to the store it, it creates a nice safe easy alternative so um when you have that good infrastructure people drive more it's also true for walking and biking and frankly we still have pretty crappy infrastructure for walking and biking in bend and um so we've been very focused on how do we improve that infrastructure and you may all know some of you who live here who voted last fall we passed a transportation bond measure to make significant investments in the transportation system in bend that it did include investments for making um, the roads work better for cars we're not doing a whole bunch of widening widening but it also include over 60 million dollars for improvements in bike lanes in sidewalks and in safety and all those things are really important because again if you don't have good safe infrastructure people are not likely to walk and bike if you don't you don't have a complete sidewalk network to get you from your house to Safeway or your house to school or your house to your job you're you're not as likely to walk um, so that's been a really important and the passing of that bond measure was a big deal however it's also important to know that the bond measure was just kind of a down payment we actually need to pay attention to some other, other parts of the system that cannot be funded through the bond measure for a bunch of reasons. That money can only go to capital investments to actually building new stuff. We also need to make investments um, in making sure that, for example, our sidewalks in the wintertime are clear and functional. If, again, you could have a pretty good sidewalk network, but if it's filled with snow because you never plow it, or the bus stops you can't get to if you're walking because they're sidewalk, they're filled with snow, that doesn't work. So um, we've got to figure out a variety of other challenges in Bend um, that are around the, the kind of programs that keep the walking and biking stuff working well. And um, that is something that our city council still has to address. So I'm very excited about the new city council that was elected last fall. We now have um, an even larger number, a majority, I think, or really all the city councilors who are very supportive of investments in walking and biking and transit. But they're going to continue to need to hear from all of us that that's important. They're going to continue to need to hear that um, as they complete their goals that are going to guide them for the next two years, that we tell them that we want you to continue to pay attention to transportation. 
We want to be able to get around safely. We want to be able to walk places, to bike places. And when we need to drive, we, we need to have roads that are safe as well. Um, and they especially need to hear about it when they establish their goals for the next two years and when they pay attention to the budget for the next two years. Because the bottom line is we can have a lot of good plans and we can have a lot of good city councilors, but if they don't put their money where their mouth is, it kind of doesn't make a difference. So the budget process is really important. So communicating with city councilors, the transportation infrastructure is essential in our community. I just encourage all of you to do that. Um, and go to the city website, um, bendoregon.gov, and in the upper right, you'll see city council, click on there, and you can send an email to everybody. And the final point I'd make is that, you know, transportation is still one of the biggest sources of greenhouse gas emissions here in Oregon and across the country. And paying attention to the system, as Graham was talking about, yes, it's about the personal choices that we make, but if we don't have a good system that enables those choices, the choices are constrained because the system itself is the problem. That still is true here in Bend, Oregon, around walking and biking and alternatives to the car. Um, so super important, transportation is super important from a, a climate perspective in reducing emissions. And that's what I have on that, Neil. I'll just um, hand it back to you to talk about the other stuff. You're mute, Neil. Uh, I thought that I was doing really well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember to turn my camera back on. Um, okay, so at the city level, um, two different areas that I was going to talk about are um about the community climate action plan and the environment and climate newly formed environment and climate committee here at the city so um, these are two actions um led and encouraged by a lot of work in the in the community to really get the city to institutionalize some of these changes that we all find really important about taking climate action um, and taking kind of important climate action so um I'll, I'll start with the CCAP, um, which is uh, the acronym for the Community Climate Action Plan. And this is something for those of you that live in the city of Bend. Um, this is an established set um, of um, this is an established set of climate change actions that the city um, wants to be involved in. Um, and there's a series of these pieces that um, are essentially a roadmap. Um, to try to meet the climate goals that we set forward a few years ago. So um, this is a great, if you haven't looked into this, this is a really great space to both see some of the actions that have been identified as um, possibilities or um, as goals for the city. Um, and to, you know, those are, those are messages that are well received at the local government level too. So um, if there's something on there and you're not seeing the action that you would like to see, those are messages that, um, that can be well heard. Um, the other area is the newly formed Environment and Climate Committee. So this is a standing committee in the city of Bend. Um, I am a member of this committee, um, I think with seven others or six others. Um, and this is really an opportunity for um, the counselors, when they're making their decisions, um, have a lot of things that they need to focus on. And so the committees are an opportunity to bring in local experts um, to help advise um, and answer some questions that they have. So um, the, the need was identified. And as a part of the CCAP finishing up, um, this was the newly formed committee to try to help make sure that um, we actually follow, implement, and fund the CCAP, like Mike mentioned, as being really important. Um, this also is a really good opportunity if you have um, if you have issues and ideas that you think are really important in terms of local climate action. Um, this is the these are the people that you should be reaching out to um, to propose those and bring them to the group um, because we are um, will have the ability at some point to actually be reviewing those and make some formal proposals to the city. So. Um, those are just a couple of small opportunities at the city level, um, and I think I think it's really exciting. I've been actually doing some, this is a little bit of a tangent, but doing some work at the state level to allow cities to adopt uh, more stringent 
uh, energy codes, building codes. And um, the message that really resonates there that's really important is that um, cities get to push the envelope. We get to experiment, we get to prove that something is possible and actually works. Um, so um, if you're not motivated by federal politics, um, then just work your way down the chain until you find a, a large enough group that you feel like you can make some action there. So um, we're gonna jump up next to the Oregon legislature and Mike's gonna talk about a couple of climate related bills um, with this current legislative session. And, Neil, before I do that, I know um, uh, I got a question from um, a couple other folks who are operating in the background to help us kind of field questions and stuff. And there was a question from Jana about public transit in Bend and is there anything moving there? Um, and um, so a, just a brief bit of background, um, transit in Bend is operated by a different governmental entity. It's called the Central Oregon Intergovernmental Council. It's a council of governments that includes the local cities in Central Oregon, as well as the county governments. So Bend, Lapine, Sisters, Deschutes County, Jefferson County, Crook County, that kind of stuff, all have representatives, as well as there are other members of the public that serve on the board. And that entity runs the transit system for the whole region, including they contract with the city of Bend to provide um, the transit services that you see that serve the city within the city limits. And um, most or almost all of the money to pay for that comes from the city of Bend and the general fund and other sources of revenue. There are some other monies that they get as well. So they operate that system. So the city, um, you know, the way that the city government influences that is they determine the level of service that they want to um, see provided in their community and then they they contract to provide that. There's a real challenge about funding transit in general because it takes quite a bit of money and generally transit does not pay for itself right from fair revenue. That's true Ben, it's true in New York City, it's true all over the world. You have to supplement it with other sources of revenue from government. So there's a challenge in how do we expand it here. In 2017, the state legislature passed a new law that is slowly bringing new and additional revenue to Bend and Deschutes County. Because of COVID and the pandemic, the uh, increase in that revenue, I think, has been stalled or slowed down a little bit. But over the next year, year and a half, we're going to start to see more transit routes in Bend and more frequent service with longer hours. The issue in our community is not that we don't have a base level of service, it's that the transit doesn't operate with a long enough hour. So it, you know, if you work a swing shift and to get, get, get off your job at 11 o'clock, you can take the bus to work, but you can't take the bus home currently, right? So we need to change that, the service hours. It doesn't operate on enough days of the week. It's pretty light service still on the weekends, especially Sunday. And then we don't have routes going to enough places. Over time, this new money from the state is gonna help solve that problem, but it won't solve it entirely. The challenge is getting governments to work together to spend more money on it. And again, this is one of these things that ultimately what it means is we need to communicate that it's important to us, to our elected officials, both in the city, but also at the county level. And if you live in Redmond, you should be communicating that to your Redmond city councilors. It's still the same county commissioners at the county level and getting them to pay attention that the community wants this, the service is valuable, and it's particularly valuable to people who cannot afford a car. A car is not a, a cheap thing to operate, and there are many people in our community who can't afford the cost of a car to get them to work, to get them to school, to get them to health care, to recreation, to, to go shopping for the food that they need. And that's why we need a transit service. We've had very high ridership levels here, um, but we're gonna need to support it. It's about having a system that serves the entire community. So transit is, is related to city government, but it's a bigger issue than just city government. So I hope, Janet, that helps answer some of the questions about um, where transit is going. And we're gonna continue to advocate for improved service in the region. Um, so on the... At the state level, people probably know the legislature is back in session. They just started a couple of weeks ago. Um, there are a series of bills that we are paying attention to kind of in three different buckets. One of them was uh, related to waste, which I'll talk about later, um, just briefly. One is related to some electric vehicle stuff that Neil's gonna talk about. And then another is related to kind of broadly around energy. And <clears throat> you may know that there was a, 
uh, bill in the last couple sessions that generated a lot of conflict and controversy and the Republicans walked out, clean energy jobs bill, um, and it was trying to set up a whole system to regulate emissions in the state and permits and stuff. Um, that bill has not been successful. The governor is trying to implement some elements of that on her own. But there's a couple bills this session that are pretty important that we're paying attention to. There's actually two different bills that are trying to turn the electric system that we have in the state and make it 100% clean energy or coming from renewable energy sources. One of the bills has been introduced. It's House Bill uh, 2995. Again, it's House Bill 2995 for those who want to track it. Um, there is an alternative bill that is still a legislative concept that should get turned into a bill soon that's trying to do the same thing. There's kind of two bills that are competing with each other a little bit. We're interested in both of them. We'd really like to see um, our electric grid become 100% renewable. Again, going back to Graham's point in the film that you know, if our system is based largely on fossil fuels, which it still is significantly here in, some, in Oregon, even with the hydropower we have in the region, um, we, you know, there's not much we can do. We we're all need to use electricity. That's the world we live in today. Um, so it constrains out the options that we have. So we really need to change this system problem. We have the ability to shift it to 100% renewable energy. So there's this House Bill 2995 and then a legislative concept that's called Legislative Concept 1041, if you want to pay attention. Those are both bills that we're watching very closely. Um, the other thing many of these bills are trying to do is pay attention on the energy side um, to helping the parts of, the, of our communities and state, the families that are lower income and have been more impacted by climate change. Um, and so helping families like that um, retrofit their homes to make them more energy efficient, trying to figure out ways that um, they don't have to pay super high uh, utility bill costs. So there's a bunch of stuff like that happening on the policy side related to energy. I think the key thing without getting into lots of wonky details is um, watch our e-newsletter. If you're not on our e-newsletter yet, I'd encourage you to sign up for it. And as these bills start to make their way through the legislature, we'll do our best to keep you up to date and tell you when to weigh in. And eventually we'll recommend a bill that we would encourage people to ask their state representatives to vote for or their state senators to vote for. But that's the best way to keep up to it, keep up to date is to, to sign up for our e-newsletter at envirocenter.org. Do you want to chat about the electric vehicle, Neil? Yeah, um, I think I'm on mute at this time. So I, I think it's important to, um, to maybe have a little bit of a discussion of exactly what this looks like. So like Mike mentioned, um, you can, depending on how deep into this you want to get, you can early on in this process be following legislative concept and making comments to the people that are drafting this. This is a lot of the work that we're um, we're doing more of at the Environmental Center behind the scenes to try to make sure that this is um, uh, that these opportunities um, are drafted in a way that we think is really going to be successful. Um, but like he said, this is also a really good time to follow the people that you trust um, in the areas that you. Um, that you have interest in, um, because they're going to be uh, reading through things with a fine-tooth comb, and and when that that's a good opportunity to follow those action alerts, like we were talking about. Um, so there's a number of bills on the electric transportation side um, that I'm really excited about this year, and really, you know, uh, legislation and um, all of these pieces are a work in progress, and so. A lot of the pieces on the electric transportation side are recognizing that there are some challenges with the system as we've had it set up until this point. So a lot of the bills on the electric transportation side that I'm seeing and following um, are paying attention to the investments that utilities are making in electric transportation and allowing them to, uh, to, to make more um, investments. And then also, improving who is able to get the rebates um, and incentives around electric transportation. So right now, the state has really great rebates for um, purchasing a pers or a yeah, light duty personal vehicle, um, both for new and used, and they have an income qualified section. And a lot of the bills 
that are out there in this session are really working to improve those um, so then they're um, better utilized and um, able to be processed more efficiently. So some of it, you know, um, the, these can be pretty significant. So one of the bills that uh, we're following um, would allow for a low income person in Oregon to be able to get a $5,000 rebate on a used electric vehicle, which is huge. So um, these are really exciting, um, really democratizing the benefits of electric transportation. Um, and um, I also, um, yeah, I'll pass it back to Mike for right to repair. Um, then we'll talk about a little bit of congressional stuff and then we can um, we can wrap things up maybe a little bit early. So before I do the waste up in the legislature, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna just take a little detour and stay on energy for a second. We had a question from David about um, another organization here in the community, 350 Deschutes is promoting a city and or county adoption of something called commercial property assessed clean energy and he's wondering if the Environmental Center um, would join in advocating for this. And we actually are already working um, in the background to support 350 to shoots on that. We agree that um, commercial property assessed clean energy program or what people call CPACE um, would be a really important um, tool to have in our community. It does require both the city and the county to partner on it. That's gonna be the most efficient way for us to get a good program going in our community. So um, again, advocating to city councilors and to the county commissioners, Commissioner Adair, Commissioner DeBone, um, and Commissioner Chang. I'm very excited to be able to say that that for the first time um, since he's newly elected and uh, to the commission. Um, without going into getting real wonky with CPACE, basically it's a financing mechanism. It's another tool to help commercial businesses um, get additional financing that supports either renewable energy on a commercial building project or, and or improving the efficiency of that project. It's a tool that's been used, used in many other communities and it's something we should definitely be, be doing here in Central Oregon. And we definitely support 350 to Shoots and the effort to get that going. Um, on the waste side in the legislature, there are two bills that we're watching. One is House Bill 2065, which would help modernize Oregon's recycling system. And one of the most exciting parts about it is it would apply a principle called extended producer responsibility that basically says, if when you produce a product, you're gonna have to help pay for the end of life costs of that project, of that product, whether it's disposal or recycling. We're not gonna put all that cost on local communities and on consumers. Um, of course, it's more complicated than that. There's more going on in the bill, but that's what I think is one of the most important parts of the bill is that finally Oregon is gonna really apply this idea on a more system-wide way of extended producer responsibility. Um, it represents a long bit of work that has been done by the Oregon DEQ and working with the waste and recycling industry to come up with the proposed bill. Um, it's something we support. There probably are ways to improve it, but, um, but it's something that we hope will pass a version of that this session. The other one is a right to repair bill. It's House Bill 2698. That bill is basically saying that um, in our modern world, too many of our products are designed to just be thrown away and that manufacturers make it very difficult for a local person to repair products or for a local business to be set up to repair products because they, they don't give you the instructions, they um, don't give you the parts that you need. They won't give you the tools that you need. They'll set it up so things are disabled when you try to do something on the software side. And it just make it really, really difficult to make repair possible. So this bill is, again, a right to repair bill and it would change state law in such a way that um, manufacturers will be required to provide more of the information, more of the tools and not make it difficult um, for people to actually conduct repairs, especially to not say, oh, you have to go to just our approved dealer or just our approved repair center. Um, it would allow a local person to set up a, a repair shop a lot more effectively. So we definitely support that right to repair bill. Again, it's House Bill 2698. Um, and that's kind of what I had to share with people um, at the state level. And Lauren, I don't know if you wanna share any other questions with us. Um, there's two, two things I wanted to share at the federal level. First of all, on the climate side, um, people probably know that 
The new Biden administration has done a lot with executive orders to try to roll back a variety of things that the Trump administration put in place. Uh, you know, one of the ones that's pretty important that they just um, put in place was to um, have the United States uh, rejoin the Paris Climate Accord. That's a really important step in terms of international cooperation and collaboration on addressing climate change. And we're pretty excited about that. I saw today that um, they announced that they're calling together some kind of a summit on Earth Day in April um, to talk about climate action, and I'm assuming some parts of the climate accord. Um, but it's really uh, going to be a wait, wait, a bit of a waiting game before we see the bigger pieces of legislation coming up at the federal level. Nothing's been introduced yet, and I think it'll probably be some, some time because they're paying attention to the COVID situation and the economic consequences first. Um, on the, the other thing that some of you may have seen today that's a little different from the climate issue is that Senator Wyden for the last year or so has been working on a new bill to expand the Wild and Scenic River system in the state of Oregon. And on the front page of the bulletin today, there was an article about this. He's introducing a bill with Senator Merkley um, basically to add, I think it's roughly 4,700 miles to the Wild and Scenic River system in Oregon. And there's sections of the Deschutes River, um, much of Tumalo Creek that runs through Shevlin Park and eventually into the Deschutes River um, up near Tumalo State Park, um, sections of Wyshoes Creek and, and the, Crook, the Crooked River, the North Fork of the Crooked, um, are all have all been nominated and are part of the bill um, to actually get the protection that's provided by wild and scenic river status. That's a really important um, addition to the system of protections in our state from a water, water quality perspective, from a fish and wildlife habitat perspective, and from the recreation resources that come with that. So it's something that if you um, haven't heard about, I encourage you to check out the article in today's bulletin. And I think the organizations you could learn a lot from about this particular bill are the Oregon Natural Desert Association, ONDA, as well as Oregon Wild. They both have been very, very involved in helping craft the bill and helping get nominations that went into the bill that was introduced. So um, that's something I would pay attention to. And then again, just to remind people, um, you know, a great way to, to stay on top of what's happening from an advocacy perspective is to make sure you're si signed up for our e-newsletter. You go to envirocenter.org and you can find a link on our webpage there to sign up for our e-newsletter. And we'll have a section that is looking at what's happening in the legislature in particular, but we'll also keep you up to date on any climate stuff at the local level um, and transportation stuff at the local level and do our best when we can to, to keep federal stuff in there as well. Um, although our focus tends to be more local and state. So that's what I think we had for everybody tonight. Um, I don't see any other questions. Priscilla, did you want to do a wrap up? Yes, and I'm going to turn my camera on. Okay, can folks hear me? Yeah. Yes, thumbs up. Okay, I awesome. I'm going to show my screen. Uh, give me. Let's see. Can folks see my screen? Neil, if yeah, you could just tell great. me I can't see. Okay, yeah, awesome. So uh, I just wanna um, thank you all again for being here. Thank you, Graham. Uh, thank you, uh, Mike and Neil and um, Lauren for, uh, and all of you for spending your Thursday evening with us. Um, I just wanna talk about some upcoming um, events that we have uh, at the Environmental Center. So Power Hour is Tuesday, February 23rd from 5 to 6, and um, the discussion is going to be Community Solar, a path to solar uh, for all. So that's going to be run um, ran by our uh, energy challenge team, uh, Lindsay and Neil. Um, so tune in to find out how you can participate in a community solar project. That's exciting. Um, and another exciting event that we are super thrilled to share with you is Mountain Film on Tour. It's going to be a new virtual experience. Uh, we have two weekends, weekend one, February 26th through March 1st, weekend two, March 5th through March 8th. Um, both weekends are showing two different playlists, awesome um, films, um, some really thought-provoking films, so you definitely will not be disappointed. And we also have a virtual raffle uh, going on um, by our, um, that we've uh, received lots of uh, donated items from um, awesome local businesses here in town. We have two um, 
uh, major uh, raffles, um, ski packages. It's it's going to be super exciting. And um, yeah, so tickets are on sale uh, and you can find all of our info at envirocenter.org. Thank you again.